What a great reminder. We live in very challenging times, don't we? Well, it's a blessing to be with you. Uh, Pastor and I, or Pastor's wife and I were discussing earlier just when the last time we were here, uh, you were under a different pastor at the time, Pastor Jared Gullion, and we really enjoyed that. Probably six, seven years ago was the last time, but not, time just goes by quickly. Um, but at the time, we had, uh, my wife and I have six children, and all of them, I believe, were with us at the time. And so that was interesting because we were full-time ministry. We lived in a camper, and I pulled, pulled it with a 50-passenger van. And so we crisscrossed the Rockies and different places, and we had quite an interesting time for about two, three years, uh, literally on the road, living on the road. Uh, but then a lot of our children have, have grown and have left uh, the nest. But we have our daughter here with us, our daughter Hannah. She's 17, and she's going to be a senior this year. And so uh, we snagged her to come along with us, and so we're glad that she was able to do that. Um, but life changes, doesn't it? A lot of things happen. Uh, your children grow up, and then also we have grandkids too. So that's a, a blessing. And they live here in Kentucky, actually, in northern Kentucky, close to Cincinnati, so we always, we always have to, when we travel, we always have to go by there. Grandma says we have to go by there, whether, whether we're, it's on the way or not, because our grandbabies are there. So, okay, go figure. That's, that, but yeah, that's okay. I love my grandkids, so it's great to be here. So this particular program is called The Search for Truth, and I, I asked Pastor for permission because I wanted my wife to be able to come up and share. She's all that you see out there, the, the museum, is her doing. She, she created it. She made those backboards. And, and, the, the, and I helped her with the cases and things like that. But a lot of things we've collected, things that we have actually found at dinosaur, dinosaur digs and things like that, um, all those things that are out there that really are just from my wife's mind. And she's very artistic. And so... Uh, she's very scientifically minded, and that's her background is science. And so I'm going to have her help me uh, with this particular uh, seminar, this, this particular lecture. I think that you'll learn a lot. And then some of that, of course, you'll, you'll see out there what we're discussing is going to be right out there in the portable museum we have out there. And by the way, there are some resources out there that don't have an, they don't have a price tag on them. They're just a donation of, of any amount, and you can just put the money in the, the box if you want to. Um, and, uh, but if you really would like something, you don't have money, just go ahead and take it anyway, too. A uh, particular one, I was talking about dinosaurs. Oh, I don't have that with me. Um, but there's a, a DVD out there. It's not something we produce. It was Creation Today in Pensacola, Florida, produced it. It's called In Search, of the, uh, Search for Truth. Um, excuse me. The Truth About the Dinosaurs. Uh, and it's really fabulous. So if you liked what was said this morning or want more or you weren't here this morning kids love it and and adults too but it's just again just um, take one donation basis or if you can't afford it then take one anyway because you, you might want to pass it on to your grandkids or your kids to, to watch so uh, without further ado we're going to get started and I don't have a clicker so I'm just going to tell him to go to the next slide so if you'll go to the next slide that'd be great so what do you see, and, and you could, and, and I want you to be, um, I, this is not a rhetorical question, I'm asking you a question. What do you actually see here? Anyone can tell me what they see? Young man? You see a bird, okay. Anyone else see anything? Okay. Okay. Well, it's a, a <laughs> you can't hit it. Okay, the next slide, we better go to the next slide here. So then some people say, they see what? A rabbit, okay. Yeah, so it's, next slide. So it's all a matter of perspective. The importance of perspective is only when viewed from the right perspective will the truth be found. And so that's what we want to expound on. That's what we want to talk about this morning is the difference of really what, what evolution says and what God's Word says and real science says. And with that, I'm going to have my wife come up and share with you some science. Well, I talk with my hands, so I guess I'll do it this way. All right, so next slide. 
All right, we're going to look at the perspective of the secular view, how life changed over millions of years, how we start with a simple cell and then things changed into what we are today. Next one. But when you look at a simple cell, it is not very simple. And there's no way that even this, quote, simple cell could have come together by chance. A cell itself is, is, is as complicated as a city. It's got the library where the DNA is stored. It's got factories. It's got communication going back and forth. When evolution first came to be and they started thinking about a simple cell slowly changing, a cell looked like a little glob of jelly under their simple microscopes. Today we know simple cells aren't simple, and there's no way even the cell could have come together all by itself. There's no way for that DNA to have come together. Somebody had to write the code. Next one. Now the law of biogenesis is still in every science textbook. You can look it up in the concordance and you can find the law of biogenesis. And this law says that all life must come from pre-existing life. That law right there totally wipes away evolution. All life has to come from pre-existing life. And that pre-existing life was God. Next one. Oh, Louis Pasteur, by the way, is the one who discovered that law. And he's the one who did the scientific experiments proving even something as simple as bacteria has to come from bacteria. Next one. All right. One organism will change into something new given enough time. Time is the magic word, the magic wand for evolution. Given enough time, one thing is gradually going to change into something else. But is that really what we see? Next. Look at this amber. You can still tell me what creatures are there in that amber because they look exactly like what we still have today. The spider, the mosquito, the scorpion, exactly like it. But yet they say this is 50 million year old amber. So if things gradually change over time, then the older the fossil, the diff more difference we should see in what we have today. But things haven't changed. Now, the amber's not really 50 million years old. The way they get this date is the deeper in the earth, the older it is. But if all the layers were laid together, it's all the same age. And we'll get to that in a minute. Next one. Here's the horseshoe crab. The horseshoe crab, they find at the very lowest level, and the, hence the very old age of 450 million years old, yet you still find them on the beach today exactly the same. So if evolution were possible, they should have totally changed by now. Next one. Cryonoids. Cryonoids are one of my favorite fossils. They're also the most abundant of the fossils. You can find cryonoids on the top of the Himalaya Mountains. You can find cryonoids in the bottom of the Grand Canyon and everywhere in between. A cryonoid is a sea lily. It grows in the bottom of the sea even today. It looks like a lily even though it's not a flower. It's more like a, a um, starfish grabbing little food out of the water yet they haven't changed at all. So again, if evolution were true, when we look in the fossils, we should find totally different animals than what's here today, because they all would have changed. Next one. Now, the secular perspective is that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, long before man. But is that really true? And this morning we covered dinosaurs a lot. Next one. Sir Richard Owen, as we said this morning, is the one who coined the word dinosaur. So before him, they didn't call it a dinosaur. They called it a dragon. Next one. And dragons we do find with man. Next one. Marco Polo is one example. He wrote about dragons in his book. Next. Now, the, the, the myths that we have today, when you, when you ask somebody, did dragons really exist, they'd all say, oh, no, they're just a myth. They're just made up. But actually, they really did exist. They just didn't all fly like what we have today. 
right? So, but they were actual huge creatures, dinosaurs, but back then they were called dragons. Next one. Secular perspective. Fossils formed when organisms were slowly buried, layer upon layer as the layers were laid to the geological column. If you just stop and think about that for a minute, if a dinosaur died and was slowly buried year upon year, it would have rotted away before it had time to totally be buried. And all organisms are like that. They rot away very quickly. Trees, petrified forests out in Arizona, huge logs that have been turned to stone. And the signs there say that this area was covered with rivers and the river sediment, sorry, slowly buried these logs. But if it took a million years to turn it into stone, it would have rotted away before it could turn to stone. So it can't happen slowly. It has to happen fast or it'd be gone. Next one. Here's an octopus that they found. And this octopus was buried so quickly and petrified that the ink was still good. They actually scraped the ink out, mixed it with water, and drew that picture. So in an octopus, this is total soft body but it was buried quick enough that it turned to stone, the, what buried it, before it decomposed. Next one. Here's jellyfish in Wisconsin. Now, a jellyfish won't even last a day on the beach. You have to bury these quickly. And look at all the detail in that jellyfish. It was buried quick, and then that sediment turned hard. Next one. Here we have Shell Falls. Shell Falls is in the Bighorn Mountains going into Yellowstone National Park. So you're high on a mountain, you're in the middle of the United States, and what do you find embedded in the rock but seashells? It's because during the flood for an entire year, the whole world was covered with water, and the bottom of, the, of that ocean, all the sea creatures lived and grew up for that year. And then as the mountains rose and the valleys sank, they were all buried and turned to stone. And so that's why we can find crinoids on the top of the Himalaya mountains. The Himalayas, they didn't exist. They were, they were flattened. That's the ocean bottom. And then God pushed it up, and you have the crinoids there. Next one. Fossil Butte. The fish fossils out on the table came from Fossil Butte. This is a mountain in the middle of the desert in Wyoming. And then at the top of the mountain, that next picture, I'll point it out to you. You see the layer at the very top where the arrows are pointing? That's where you find the fish fossils. All those other layers, you don't find anything. And then at the top, you have the fish fossils. So during the flood, all those layers were being laid but then as you get to the top, that's where the, the world was an ocean for a long time, for the year. And that's where the fish were all living. And then when God raised the land and lowered the sea, those fish got trapped there. And that's where they died and became fossils. So the only way you can really explain that with a fish fossil, you have to bury them quick. Next one. Let's see if I show it. Yes. That's how you find them. Total fish, not decomposing, not eaten at all. This fish had to have been buried quick to turn into this fossil. Next one. And this is how you find them. You can go out on a fossil dig and dig for an hour and come home with six fossils. Easy finds. They are so cool. It's whole schools of fish that were buried quickly. Next one. Fossilization requires quick and deep burial in wet mud. The wet mud is the important part because the water will take that silica and seep it into the bone and turn it into stone. You can't just bury something in dry dirt, right? It takes the water to make the fossil. Next one. So if dinosaurs, they had to be buried quick and deep in a lot of wet mud. And that's what you had during the flood. Next one. 
Earth's features require millions of years to form. This is where a lot of people get hung up. They stand there at the rim of the Grand Canyon and they think it had to take a long time for all of this to erode out and to be a canyon. Next. However, there are modern examples. This is the island of Circe. It was a volcano that erupted. It was from the bottom of the ocean. It very quickly formed an island. Next one. Within two years, that island was covered with grass and had nesting birds on it. It looked old when it was only two years old. Next one. And look at the beach. It already had ground up sand and those rounded boulders. That would have just come from the waves in a two year time period. Next one. And then we have Mount St. Helens. I can talk for an hour on Mount St. Helens. We've got a whole other presentation, but this won't be the whole thing. But Mount St. Helens really showed how things could happen very, very quickly. Next one. In just one day, two thirds of the mountain was blown away. Cool thing about Mount St. Helens, the side was bulging. The scientists were measuring how much it was bulging. They knew it was gonna blow. So you had scientists from all over there at Mount St. Helens just watching. The whole thing is documented. Next one. All right, a close-up. This is the breached canyon wall. Two years after the eruption, there was a smaller eruption that caused a mud flow to come out of this canyon and carve this canyon here where you see the red arrow. In one day, that canyon was carved. Next one. Last summer, we went on a hike, and I found out, go back for just a minute, this looks like a deep canyon here. We took this picture from a helicopter, and it is a very deep canyon. But on this hike that we went on last summer, we got to hike around the mountain to the other side. This is just the mouth of the canyon. It's a huge canyon, which I don't have a picture up here of. But it was carved out in just a day, not by the little stream that you can see there. The red arrow is pointing to a stream. That stream didn't carve the canyon. A huge rush of water in one day carved the canyon. Next. And that mud flow then kept going and carved out this canyon system. Next. And as you hike down into there, you can see the layers looking at the side, but those layers were all laid quickly from the day of the eruption. Next one. And then you have even more layers down below. Next one. Now the secular perspective is when you see coal, that this coal was once a swamp and the peat collected at the bottom of the swamp. And then it was the ocean and then it was a swamp and ocean and swamp back and forth, back and forth is how we get these layers. But at Mount St. Helens, they showed a different story. Next one. During the eruption, a huge wave went across Spirit Lake and washed all these trees into Spirit Lake. So then you had a huge floating log mat on Spirit Lake, and the bark rubbed off and sank to the bottom. So on the bottom of Spirit Lake, you have three feet of bark just waiting to become coal. But it's not becoming coal. It's rotting away because it didn't get buried. Okay, so, but nevertheless, Mount St. Helens showed how coal could have got the start from all the logs floating on the top of the floodwaters in their bark sinking would lay the layers that could then turn into coal because those layers did get buried. All right, next one. Also, the secular perspective, when you see an upright tree like this, they say, oh, that's where the tree grew, and it grew millions of years ago, and it was slowly buried and petrified. However, there's something missing from this tree. This is a sequoia tree in Colorado, and what's missing is the roots. So it is not where this tree grew. It's where this tree sank. And during the flood, when all the trees were uprooted all across the land, and all the trees were floating on the flood's water, as they became waterlogged, they started sinking. So yes, we have up, 
upright trees that are petrified, but not because that's where they grew, that's where they sank. Next one. Same thing happened at Mount St. Helens. With those trees floating on Spirit Lake, as they became waterlogged, they started sinking root first, and they hit the bottom of the lake and were slowly starting to be buried. So Dr. Steve Austin actually went scuba diving at the bottom of Spirit Lake. So he took this picture of this upright tree sitting on the bottom of Spirit Lake. And if today we could drain the lake, we would walk across the bottom and say, wow, look at the forest that once grew here. But it's not where they grew, it's where they sank. Next one. Now these are concretions, and I didn't set my concretions out, but I'll get those out. Concretions are these huge round mysteries that scientists really don't know how they form. Right? These are from South Dakota, and you can see that we've climbed up on them. They're huge. You see them here in Kentucky in the sides of the road. The round, they're not necessarily perfectly round. They're more saucer-shaped, often in with the coal. Right? Next one. But at Mount St. Helens, these little ones formed from the ash of the volcano that landed in the streams. The eddies of the streams would swirl them around and cause these little shapes. And then they hardened together and sank to the bottom of the rivers. So you can find these in the creeks. So a little bit of ash landing in a stream causes little concretions. Imagine the strength of the whirlpools it caused it, it needed to create the huge concretions. Next one. Secular view. The Bible is full of mistakes. Okay, so we're going to switch. Oops, I lost my... You hear me okay? Okay. Put that in my pocket here. Uh, so we're going to switch gears here to more of a uh, the secular perspective in regards to history and science and er, history and archaeology, and particularly biblical archaeology. So this is probably something you have heard from time to time, that the Bible's full of mistakes. How many have heard that one form or the other? It's like, ah, oh, you can't trust it. It's been copied so many times. You know, who's, who's to say what is, what is really true or not true? A lot of them just throw it out completely. And of course, from those a secular perspective, a lot of them, who are convinced that evolution is true, or they have some other type of alternative they think in their minds, they, they just dismiss anything that rings of truth from the Bible because they don't want to believe the Bible in the first place. So that's, that's what we're up against all the time, especially in today's society. So, the, so they say that the Bible's full of mistakes and since it's been copied so many times, but then Something happened in biblical archaeology that changed that. So next slide. And that is a really incredible find called the Dead Sea Scrolls. How many have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, good. Quite a number of you have heard of, have heard of it. So you, maybe you've studied it too. It's very fascinating. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back to that. I'm, I'm sorry about that. So with the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were discovered in 1947, and and then. Through 1947, by the way, Israel became a state or country in 1948. Isn't that interesting in God's timing? So that, that they could be preserved and, not, and, and protected. So from 1947 to 1956, over 800 scrolls were uncovered. Uh, 19 complete copies, by the way, of Book of Isaiah, 25 copies of Deuteronomy. These are complete copies. 30 copies of Psalms and parts of every Old Testament, Old Testament book except for the book of Esther. Now, there are other things that they find as well. Um, but what we are concerned about here is the biblical aspect of it. That is, these 800, of these 800 scrolls, complete copies. So then when you take that complete copy and you compare it to the oldest manuscript that we have, it's of like a thousand years later, what we see next slide, is that there is no difference whatsoever between what they find, that complete copy of Isaiah, by the way, or Psalms, or one of the others, and they compare it to what we have, there's, there's nothing that has changed. So that's just God preserving his word. And so that throws out the complete secular perspective that it's been copied so many times, that it's, that it, what, who's to say if it's true or not, or what parts of it is really accurate. That throws that, that idea out the window. Next slide. 
So again, the secular perspective, and that is mostly likely from an evolutionary perspective, they say that Moses was not able to write because if you think about the evolutionary time frame, he should not have been able to, to be able to write at that time yet. So it was thought that writing it up and invented at Moses' time, but that is according to the evolutionary timeline. So he could not have possibly written the first five books of the Bible. But again, biblical archaeology throws that idea out the window. Next slide. And that was by the discovery of the Ebla tablets. Anyone ever heard of the Ebla tablets? Okay. Well, Ebla tablets, I did a research paper on that years ago in, in Bible college. And it was fascinating to me because... Um, it was 15,000 copies, of, or that is, tablets, were uncovered in Syria in 1975. It was, it was a farmer who was plowing his field, and boom, he hit something. He thought, oh, man, a rock. I have to dig up one of those again. So he looks at it like, this is not an ordinary rock. It has some strange writing on it. We know that as cuneiform today, or called wedge-shaped writing. So what he inadvertently uncovered was a library a huge library of 15,000 tablets. And so it goes back uh, way before Moses, a good thousand years before Moses, several of those. And a lot of those do pertain to, uh, they talk about different ge geographical areas of the Bible uh, and events of the Bible that the Bible also talks about. So what it's saying is not only Moses knew how to write and rising it, writing had really been from the beginning, but that also that there are different descriptions that we find also in the Bible that are verified by the Ebla tablets. Next slide. So the Bible's, the, the Bible's perspective or the biblical perspective is God created everything. It says, in six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. By the way, who's saying this? God is, isn't he? He's saying it, dictating it to Moses. And Moses is writing it down in what we know as the Ten Commandments, the, the two tables. And so if God is saying to us that he created the world in six days and ceased from his labor on the seventh day, <clears throat> giving us the seven-day week, I'm not going to argue with God. And so this is something, of course, and then if you think about it, where does the seven-day week come from? We don't find it in astronomy. We do find the earth going around the sun through astronomy, the lunar calendar, of course, with the months, but we don't find that with the average week because it all goes back to Genesis. It all goes back to the reiterated in Exodus that we have a seven-day week that God created it that way. And by the way, some people have tried to change that. It's kind of funny, uh, the French, during the French Revolution, they, they made it a 10-day week. Can you imagine you have a 10-day work week? Then you would give a day of rest. Like, what in the world were they thinking? They didn't, they didn't have that for very long. Because this is what God created, and it makes sense. Now, we are blessed, a lot of us, to work only five days and have two days off. Uh, a lot of times people were working six days and only had one day off. That was it. But God said, you've got to have one day off, one to worship and also to rest. And so that's very important. Next slide. So even the secular scientists admit that the law by Genesis has never been proven wrong. Again, what my wife said earlier, all life must come from pre-existing life. This is a scientific fact. This is not something that can be, be thrown out the window. Is something that is accepted by science begrudgingly for some of them, but it is true. Next slide. So the biblical perspective is that there are distinct kinds. In Genesis 1-1, God told the plants to reproduce after their kind, and birds and fish would reproduce after their kind, and God said the cattle, beasts, and creeping thing would reproduce after their kind, and then God created man and woman in his image and told them to fill the earth. And we are distinct completely from the rest of the animals. And God did that, made that very clear when he created the animals. He created them instantaneously, right? A cow, boom. He wanted a cow that was there, alive, probably bending its head down to eat grass. And chickens and all doing what, they, what chickens do and other creatures do. But when God created Adam, 
created from the dust of the ground. And you could picture Adam laying there on the ground, but he's lifeless until what? God breathed into him the breath of life. And so showing that he was totally different from the rest of God's creation. And it's sad because we have a lot of, I love pets, so we love dogs and cats and all those, uh, but a lot of times in our today's society, those were elevated even above humans. And save the whales, right? And abort the humans. And we, we have this happening a lot, of course, in the event of Roe versus Wade. Thankfully, praise God, that that is no longer. But now, of course, we fight different battles, don't we? And we're, we're still fighting for the right to life. Anyway, God created us in His image. And if that should say anything, that should say everything in regards to human life because we are separate and different from the rest of God's creatures. That doesn't exempt us from taking care of God's creatures that he, that he, he, because he gave us that dominion mandate at the beginning. Next slide. So observation and science show kinds are, are fixed yet flexible. So you can see that we have all different kinds of animals, right, and within a kind, in this case we have horses, and they're all different sizes, right, but they're still what? Horses. And so when they, when evolutionists, they get all excited when they find horses in the fossils, and they say, oh, here's, they're, they're this size, and they're this size, and they try to uh, put them all in different categories, but th the bottom line is, they're still horses. And so it's really ridiculous that they would try to classify them in any other way because they're still all going. Now, if you found a cow becoming a horse or vice versa or whatever, that might be interesting and they might have something there, but you don't find that in the fossil record. They have never found anything like that in the fossil record after they, and they continue to dig, hoping they will find that transitional creature going from one creature to another creature, but they're never going to find it because it, it's not going to happen. Next slide. So if you did find one moving into another, maybe you would find a creature like this. What would you call it? Maybe an ellibird or something? Um, but yet, if evolution were true, we should find things like this in the fossils all over the place. But you don't find a single one. Oh, they come up with a few things like Archaeopteryx and others. but. But what scientists, even secular scientists, even were saying is, uh, well, really, uh, it's classified as a bird, not a dinosaur uh, becoming a bird, which uh, sometimes we, we do find, and uh, well, we do find in quite a few in the textbooks so that a dinosaur is now a bird. Ridiculous. But um, <laughs> don't have time to go into that. So, Yet no kind has ever been observed changing into another kind, and that's very important, especially what we find or don't find in the fossil record. Next slide. The biblical perspective that there was a worldwide flood. I'm going to read this to you. Ed, the flood was 40 days upon the earth. All the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered, and the mountains were covered. That's very important. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. So we see very distinctly here that this was not a localized flood. Uh, some of my uh, Christian friends would say that it was a local flood, but they can't explain a lot of things, and one of those is why were the mountains covered if it was a localized flood? We know whether the mountains were only a couple thousand feet back then, um, or 15,000 feet like the Himalayas, they were covered and up to 20 feet or so above that, the Bible talks about. Next slide. So fossils filled sedimentary rock and they encircled the globe and that in and of itself is an example of something that was huge and cataclysmic as, the, as we know as Noah's flood or the worldwide flood. That makes sense. Their perspective doesn't make any sense. Next slide. So the unexplainable becomes clear in the light of the flood. And we, we uh, my wife has really pointed out, and I pointed out before, is we've traveled quite a bit. And one of the places we stopped was in southern Idaho. And this is a, what does that look like to you? Does it look like, a, 
the, the rock, what does it kind of symbolize? Is there a symbol there? Looks to me like a, maybe a question mark, perhaps. Maybe you're through thinking about a, a punct punctuation or something of those English enthusiasts in, in the audience. So this makes it very clear that this is not something that came about by eons of time, but yet this is a result of water runoff from the flood. Uh, as mentioned earlier in Psalms 104, God says he raised the land and lowered the sea. And by doing that, there's a lot of water that was on the earth, right? And all of it's going to be channelized as it makes its way to the ocean. And by doing so, it's going to be creating features like this. That makes sense, just like we have the Grand Canyon. That would have been a result of, of different perspectives. But one of the perspectives, it was channelized as at the end of the flood when God raised the land and lowered the sea. So the unexplainable becomes clear in the light of the flood. And if we think again, all the features that we see, not in the terms of, well, this was millions of years, but that this is something that took place very rapidly, and, and this is the, the reason why we see the features that we do. And by the way, here on the East Coast, you would see probably more things like this, but, and, the, and you do if you were to remove all the vegetation, uh, especially go up into Virginia and Eastern Kentucky and places like that, you see things that are, look more channelized, but we don't see them so much because of all the trees and the vegetation. When you go out west, that's a whole different story. Next slide. In the ark, all were safe and sound, but outside its walls, all else had drowned. The beautiful world that God had made was now a swirling, mud-filled sea, for God could not allow wickedness to be. Next slide. Well, oh, how he grieved while destroying his creation, when splitting asunder its very foundation, watching layer after layer of mud and debris being laid beneath man and beast's watery grave. Oh, if only people would learn to behave. Next slide. It's not hard to imagine what could have transpired, what thoughts the turbulent sea inspired. While watching the death of those who had strayed, I can almost hear God the Father say, My son, my son, how shall we teach them to obey? Next slide. And his reply, let's turn these trees to stone and preserve the animal's bone. Then as the waters from land recede, it will channel through the muddy ground uncovering the fossils so they'll be found. Next slide. Generations that come and go will have no excuse but to know, for there in the rocks they will clearly read the story of this destructive day. They, they will be reminded of their need to learn your, your will and your will obey, for only by following your instruction will man be saved from utter destruction as some were on this day. Next slide. So, but if fossils are from the flood, then dinosaurs were on the ark. And we talked quite a bit earlier about dinosaurs, but uh, again, the question that many secular humanists and, and evolution would, would really sarcastically say to us is how do these dinosaurs fit on the ark? Again, the, it's a matter of everything starts out small, doesn't it? And then gets larger over time. So Noah did not have to take the, the granddaddy T-Rexes on board the ark. All he had to take were the babies or the teenagers, which makes a lot of sense. So then they would be reproducing after, after they disembarked the flood a year later, of the ark, excuse me, a, a year later. Next slide. Again, so reptiles, they start out life small, and they, get, they, they grow larger and larger as time goes on. Next slide. And then two perspectives of ancient man, that we have two perspectives that either we were created in God's image, or that we are a result of evolution, uh, beginning from ape, uh, really to what we are today. Again, there's nothing in the fossil record that shows that, that apes have transitioned into man. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, we have some like Neanderthal man, and you probably <laughs> recognize that one because uh, in the movies and all, that kid, we have kid shows and movies, we see that word a lot. But that's only because the region where the, these folks used to live uh, in the Neanderthal Valley of Germany, that's where the name came from. But we, what we see would, is, is that these uh, people who lived in these caves were very sophisticated. They, they buried their dead, 
Uh, they had they they loved music. They 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 built they made um, musical instruments. They they loved painting. They painted the, their walls of their cave. And by the way, people still live in caves today. If you go to China and all over, the, these these are popular places for people. So it's not because they're primitive. It's it's intelligent men and women that were living in these places, and these are intelligent men and women who would have been living in these places as well. And real quickly, some of the words that probably you may may have heard before, sewn in the textbooks like Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man, Peking Man, all of them have been proven to be hoaxes or completely doctored. That is where they took the jawbone of an orangutan and maybe a skull of a human and put them together. But they've all been proven to be false, if you could even find the information today, because that is an embarrassment on the evolution part. Next slide. So does caveman equal ape man? No. Again, we see sophisticated, intelligent man on the left, and we see what's an artistic, uh, tr quote, supposedly transition between ape and man on the right. Next slide. And then we have, the, after the Tower of Babel, that is when God told them to, to leave uh, that, that region, and they wouldn't do it uh, willingly, so he had to confuse their languages. And so they all scattered to different parts of the world, and their language was different. And so that's where the nations start. Next slide. And at the Tower of Babel, at Babel that's where the nations start. I got ahead of myself, sorry. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> So God that made the world and all things therein hath made of one blood of nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined their times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So in other words, these 70 different nations, uh, groups of people, that is, and languages that came out of the Tower of Babel, all, it's interesting, whether you go to South America with, with the Incas, you go to the Mexico with the Aztecs, you go to Egypt where we have um, the, the Egyptians building the pyramids, um, and different other parts of the world where we find sophisticated buildings that are built all seem to come from shortly after the Tower of Babel. So then we have intelligent man building things ahead of time, now taking that technology with them wherever they went. This, is, again, is not primitive man, it's intelligent man. Next slide. In the biblical perspective of Earth's history, we have God created a perfect utopia at the very beginning in Genesis 1.31. It says that he created a perfect world, and it was all good, he says. In fact, he says it was very good. Next slide. And then Adam and Eve disobeyed God and followed Satan. And we see that in Genesis 3. All that that they enjoyed before, however long they enjoyed it. We don't know how many weeks, months, or whatever it was. They enjoyed it, but then they chose to disobey and eat the fruit, and then all that changed. And then next slide. And then God had to curse the world, and, but yet he offered redemption to man. So then we get into Genesis 3, we see not only God saying, this is what's going to happen, Adam, this is what's going to happen, Eve, but yet I'm going to provide myself as the creator, as the Savior. And so we see that in Genesis 3.15, and then following all throughout, we see where in prophetic, in uh, the different prophecies, we see that Jesus will be coming to this earth. Some 300 prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. Impossible mathematically to explain it otherwise. All fulfilled in Jesus, who would become the Messiah. So he's in, the creator who then becomes the Savior. Next slide. So Adam, animal sacrifices were a picture of Christ. So why was it necessary to have animal sacrifices? One, for them to see that what Adam and Eve did was so horrible that God would have taken perhaps maybe a pet lamb or something that, that Eve had and slaughtered that animal. Why? In order for two things. One, for them to show them that death now takes place because of their sin. And then the blood that was shed which would remind us, would, would, would visualize eventually that what Christ would do by shedding his own blood and then covering them with, that, with the animal skin. And so what we see so many things here with that sacrifice, and that was to be maintained throughout history in order to remind the Israelites really and then eventually to us what would take place 
as Galatians 4, 4 says, in the fullness of time that Christ would come and would and be, become our sacrifice. Next slide. After 2,000 years, man's wickedness was br brought God's wrath, and that is we have the worldwide flood. If you think about how things are, how things are going in our, in our world, and if you're like me, you've lived long enough and you've enjoyed just so many things in this country and the freedoms that we have, as Pastor mentioned um, a little earlier, and how we're seeing a lot of that be, being deteriorated and, and then being pushed into more of a socialistic, communist mindset. And our children are being taught that in schools. And so all these things are beginning to change, and it just can make you very angry and frustrated because of, of what is taking place. But yet, if you think about, I wonder what Noah's world was like, and just the, the wickedness of man that would have been so horrible that God himself said, I've got to destroy mankind. But yet, even still with that, in the mercy and the grace of God, he gave them some 100 years or so uh, for as Noah preached to them, as Peter says, preached righteousness to them for them to come on board the ark. But yet many of the, all of them, except for his family, refused to come on board the ark. Tragedy. But God, because of his mercy and his love, he still gave them that opportunity, which many of them, well, all of them, except for Noah's family, refused. Next slide. So God came to earth. He died on the cross to pay the, the price of man's sin and rose again the third day. So here's the creator, as Colossians tells us, Jesus Christ, who became our Savior. Next slide. Is that, that the last one? So then what we see, of course, all through here, all through history, is that Jesus would, first, he created the world, and then he knew what would happen in the garden, but yet, his love for mankind was still so great that he himself would become our provider, that is, our Savior. And he would do so through, through prophecy that would lead to that. And then eventually he himself would step onto this earth and, and show us what the Father was like, that the Father loved us and that he sent his Son to die on the cross for us. So I plead with you, my brothers and sisters, and I ask that you would realize that even though a lot of our rights and all have been taken away, we still can have Jesus, and we can still belong to him. And if you have never placed your faith and trust in him, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. We don't have the assurance of tomorrow, but we do have that today. And so don't put it off. Don't postpone that, that opportunity to meet the Creator face to face because He loves you and He gave His life for you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the Creator. We thank you that through the corridors of time, you, through sacrifices and others, you, you, you're, you put that perspective of knowing that we um, need you and that we would be reminded that you are the Creator and that even though we did wrong, and that even though we weren't Adam and Eve, but we yet we're born into sin, and we have, we have that into our hearts and our lives, we're born with that. And but because of you, Lord Jesus, we can be reconciled to the Father. So I ask that, that if there's someone here who's never placed their faith and trust in you, that they would do so today. Again, we may not have the opportunity tomorrow. Let's get it right today. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with this, these brothers and sisters. Lord, bless them, watch over them. Help us, Lord, as Americans, help us, Lord, to be reminded of all the blessings that we have, not just in this country, but just in what we have in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all you've done. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.